Today we are going to talk, uh, it's our third week of Advent, and our series is called We Believe, and it's important for us to, to protect the things that we believe in. In week one, Nick shared about protecting our hope and remembering to keep that ember safe and from all harm, holding it carefully and protecting it so that it could be a flame someday, that God could fan that into flame. Drawing near to God, Zechariah and Elizabeth, that's who we talked about and how they kept that hope alive and focused out to um, when their child was born. Choose to believe that God said he will do something and then he will follow through because he is faithful. Week two of Advent PR talked about protecting our peace. Do you remember what he said peace was? The wholeness of God. Protecting our peace and that wholeness. And we met Elizabeth's cousin Mary, and an angel came and talked to her, and she had God's peace, even though she was really confused and really scared, but yet she trusted God that he was faithful. And I marvel at how these weeks all go together, hope and peace and now joy. And the Wilkinson family shared so wonderfully about what joy is and how that brings it all together. And really, they do. They flow right one to into another, don't they? The hope and the peace and the joy. And it's really beautiful how they work together. If you missed either of the sermons in the last couple weeks, make sure you check them out on our website, www.enjoylwc.com. Today, we're going to talk about joy, protecting our joy. So let's just take one last time and quick pray before we start. Holy Spirit, come. Thank you for your presence. Teach us something we've never learned before. Change us. Help us to open our hearts to you. Amen. So we need to protect our joy. Understand that the enemy is not after your finances. He's not coming after your health. He's not coming after the things that you have around you. He's after your joy. You know why? Because the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And if we lose our joy, then we lose our strength to fight off the enemy. And he knows it. We won't have physical strength, we won't have emotional strength or spiritual strength to fight off his attacks, and we won't have strength to do the good things that God is calling us to do. The enemy is after our joy, so we need to protect it. What exactly is joy? We found joy this week. We went down to Lowe's in Hornell, and we found joy. I have it up on the screen for you. Do you see it? We found it. It was enormous. For $750, you too can have joy in your front yard. <laughs> That's why we don't have joy, right? <laughs> okay, it's $750. Wow. <laughs> wow. No, I'm just kidding. Surely. I, I've seen it. I've seen it all in people's yards. Have you seen um, the yard signs and ornaments and Christmas cards? And it, they all say joy. And, and I got to thinking about it. Do we really even know what it is? Is it general? Does the world know as we put it out there? Do they really understand what joy is? I found a definition from C.S. Lewis. It was a little bit different, but still it embodies the similar things that we've already talked about today. C.S. Lewis says that joy is a desire that's not yet satisfied. And immediately we think about that perfect Christmas gift that's going to be under the tree this year. And that's why we have Christmas joy, because we're waiting for that gift. And, and we, we're, waiting, or we're waiting for that perfect recipe. Oh, we have Christmas joy because I found the best recipe this year and I'm going to share it with everybody at the best party and it's going to be the perfect party because everybody's going to get along and everything's going to be smooth and all the timing's going to work out perfectly and that's what Christmas joy is. And if you think that's what Christmas joy is, you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> and so many times we focus on that. We were at, because um, joy is more than a happy feeling. We, we tend to think that that's what that is, that happy feeling. But those happy feelings are temporary. And sometimes we base our joy on things that are not eternal, and then we're left disappointed. Ezra takes a class at GCC when he's down there, and two days a week, so PR and I will go down and we'll work. There's this little library-type area, and, and people are in and out. And I was working there earlier this week, and a woman came in. I've known her for a number of years now, and, and I commented to her. She works there. And I was like, oh, it looks so Christmassy here, and you've done a great job with it. It's so festive. And, and we chatted for a minute, and she, then she let out a, a big sigh. And she, she made this comment. She said, you know, so many people try to recreate that perfect Christmas. The one we remember as a child, or the one that was in that Hallmark show we watched last week. You know, we try to recreate that perfect Christmas, and if that's, that's not often reality, and so we're often disappointed. 
And, and there was this awkward silence because here I am working on a sermon on joy, and then she makes that comment, and my brain's like, Lord, what do you want me to say right now? This is a really important moment. And, and I just, I'm thankful for his faithfulness in that moment because he led me to say, well, I guess that's why we need to hope in something greater, like God. We need to hope in God because then our joy is real because it's in something eternal. And she agreed. We went on with our day, but I, I've pondered that moment all week and thought about it and how, you know, we really do long for something. We are really looking for something, and that's Jesus. And so without Jesus, we can't have any joy because there's no joy without Jesus. There's going to be moments in our lives that, are, that we don't feel happy that we don't have that deep feeling. Like in the morning, some of you don't feel necessarily happy first thing in the morning when you wake up. We, we had this experience a couple weeks ago. We went to a hotel for our anniversary, and we came down. And you know that complimentary breakfast? We were on the fourth floor. We, hadn't, we were on our way down to the complimentary breakfast. We were in that moment of, yeah, we're not really quite awake yet, and we really need a cup of coffee, and we need our breakfast, but, but we're, we got to ride the elevator down. So we're just standing there like, okay, we're going to make it down. And this little girl pops on, and we stop at the third floor, the little girl pops on the elevator singing, if you're happy and you know it, do all three. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, <laughs> she is so cute. And <laughs> we had a delightful conversation with the adults that were with her. <laughs> and we laughed about it. We're like, yeah, I wish we could all be like that. And sometimes we just simply don't feel like singing that happy and you know it song. We just don't. <laughs> But we can still have joy, that deep peace that the Wilkinsons mentioned, that deep, deep settledness, a calmness that, that God brings, that only God can bring. Let's look at our scripture, and we'll see how Mary had that joy. We're going to look in the book of Luke today, Luke chapter 1. So if you take out your Bibles or the Pew Bible in front of you, and you open it up halfway, I'm going to help you find an easy way. This is how the kids do it downstairs, I, and it's, a, it's good enough for them, it's good enough for us, right? Open your Bible halfway, and you're going to be somewhere in Psalms or Proverbs. And if you take the back half and you open it halfway again, you're going to be somewhere in the Gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. So find the book of Luke. It's the easiest way to do it. Find the book of Luke, Luke chapter 1. And we're going to start our story off in verse 39. Now remember we met Elizabeth two weeks ago. And at this point in time, she is six months pregnant, the Bible says. We met Mary last week, her cousin, Mary's just finding out that she's pregnant. So we've got these two women, and we're going to pick up their story in verse 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, "'Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear.'" But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting meet, reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed in the Lord, that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. That's quite a greeting. That had to be, make Mary feel so good to receive that greeting. But what was Mary really feeling during this moment? Well, she probably had some shock, right? because she just met with the angel, and she was young. She was in her early teen years, and, and women weren't really, didn't have any status at all then. And so, you know, she had all that emotion and, and all that she would just found out, and she'd just been visited by an angel. Did I say that? I mean, that had to be a shocking moment for her. Have you felt shock recently in the last couple weeks? You want what for Christmas? Did you know how expensive that is? It's called sticker shock, okay? That's what it's called. And maybe you felt that this week. We can relate with Mary, feeling shock about something. Mary probably felt strange. She just traveled over 80 miles, and that was not in a car. It probably took her three or four days. And the first couple weeks of her pregnancy, for those of you who have been pregnant, those first few months some might, might not feel too good. And imagine having to walk or ride in, on a donkey that far, three or four days when you're not feeling real good, she probably felt a sense of strain. She was exhausted, I'm sure. Anybody feel exhausted, weary, shopped till you drop, made too many Christmas cookies, perhaps, on your feet too long, ate too many Christmas cookies already? That's possible, too. 
So we can relate with Mary's strain and her exhaustion. And so many times during the holiday, we're focused on how exhausted we are and we miss the meaning of the season. Let's not get there. Let's not forget, Mary was probably stressed. I imagine that her traveling there, what was she thinking over those three or four days? How am I going to tell Elizabeth about what the angel said to me? I mean, she's a godly woman. Is she going to believe my story? Because my story is kind of unbelievable. And maybe she rehearsed it in her mind. What what am I going to say? How is she going to respond? What's going to happen? And maybe Mary was, she had to be stressed over this situation because she was human. And we would be stressed over that situation. Are you stressed about what to get someone? Stressed about who's going to be at that party? You've got to spend how many hours with that person? <laughs> you know, we're stressed about these things. We feel anxiety over these things. Here's a little side note. This was an aha moment for me as I was studying this this week. Notice that when Mary got to the door and she was on the doorstep and she greeted Elizabeth, she didn't have to tell Elizabeth about what the angel told her. Did you notice that? Because Elizabeth told Mary. The Holy Spirit reveals it to Elizabeth in that moment. She said, blessed are you and blessed is the child you will bear. She already knew what the angel, the the Holy Spirit told Elizabeth. Just as God went ahead of Mary and took care of that thing she was stressed about, God will go ahead of you and take care of that thing that you're stressed about so you can rest and relax and enjoy this season of celebration as we focus on him because God is already working ahead of you. Amen. That really blessed me when I realized that this week. Mary lived at a time of great darkness, not to mention all that she just learned, but it was a time of great darkness. The word of God had not been spoken for 400 years. There was no prophet in Israel. They were under strict Roman rule, and that was very oppressive. And there were a lot of Awful things that happened during this period to the Israelite people. They were fighting amongst themselves. There were four groups. They split into four groups, and they were fighting amongst themselves as God's people. It was a very dark time. Mary was not from a wealthy family. Joseph was not from a wealthy family. She was about to marry into another poor family. And so there was a lot of poverty around her, and she had a lot to grumble about. You know, if you really look at her life, Mary had a lot to grumble about. And it's kind of like living in 2016, huh? We kind of look around us and we might justify our grumbling. Well, we got a lot to grumble about. There's a lot of hurtful things going on. There's a lot of bad stuff out there. But let's look at Mary's response. This is why, actually, before we get to Mary's response, we're going to look at what the angels said because there was so much to grumble about and so much darkness amongst God's people then. When the angels came to announce the birth of Christ to the shepherds, In Luke chapter 2, verse 10, they say, I bring you good news that will cause great joy amongst the people. So I had to know, what is that word joy? What does it really mean in the original language? The word joy in the original language is closely related to the word grace. So closely related to the word grace that what it literally means is joy because of grace. Say that with me. Joy because of grace. Let that sink deep within Because when you can grasp a hold of this joy because of grace idea, truth, because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that means we all deserve punishment for our sins. All of us. But Jesus took that punishment upon himself. God sent him to be the embodiment of grace. Jesus is the embodiment of grace He took our sin so that we wouldn't have to be punished, so that if we accept him as our Savior, we could be forgiven. Joy because of grace. We can have joy because of Jesus. If you can't have joy, if you're not receiving grace, did you hear that? You can't have joy if you're not receiving grace. Mary had favor. That's what the angels said. You have been found with favor in God's eyes. It's the same word for grace. Those words are the same. Mary received grace and therefore she had joy. If we are holding on to sin, if you're holding on to a sin that you just don't want to let go of, you can't have joy because you're not receiving grace. If you have asked Jesus to forgive you for a sin and you haven't forgiven yourself, 
then you're not allowing yourself to receive God's grace, and therefore, you will not have joy. That's a tough one, because sometimes we can accept that God has forgiven us, but we can't forgive ourselves. You need to actually look yourself in the eye in the mirror and say, I forgive you, and let it go. Let God be the one who fills you and fills you with joy. But you can't have that if you're not receiving his grace. Some of us only focus on the negative. I'm no good. Do you know how I've messed up? I will always mess things up. Just look at my life. I have a lot to grumble about and nothing to be joyful about. If that's you, it's time to change your perspective. It's time to change your perspective. You don't have any more time in your life to live that way. It's time to live with the joy that God wants to bring you through the grace of Jesus. Let's look back at our scripture in Luke chapter 1. Mary's response to that wonderful greeting that Elizabeth gave her was a song. She literally cries out in song, the Bible says, and what she said is this, my soul glorifies the Lord. We're starting at verse 46. My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Beautiful words in a dark time. In a humble woman. She sang, my soul glorifies the Lord. That word means magnifies. My soul makes God bigger. My soul magnifies the Lord. Not my soul magnifies my problems. She didn't say that. She didn't say, my soul magnifies all the ways that I am unworthy and all the ways I've messed up. She doesn't say that. My soul magnifies God, my Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. She's not only focusing on God and magnifying him, but she's rejoicing that God is the only one that can save her from the dark things she is experiencing. And therefore, Mary has joy because of those things. In the same way, God is the only one that can save you and be your salvation from the dark things that you experience in your life. God is the only one that can help you. He's the only one that can bring salvation to you and bring you real joy if you magnify him and recognize that. Just as you can't have joy if you're not receiving grace, you can't have joy if you're not extending grace. It's just the other side of it. We need to receive grace, and then we need to extend grace if we're going to have joy. Just think about it for a minute. Do you have joy? when you are holding a grudge? Does that, like, do you have, no, 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 we don't. I see lots of heads going, no. Does it make you feel good to constantly find somebody to blame and then blame them? Does that make you feel good? Not really, not really. And how about, how about when we're nitpicking, nitpicking every little thing, every little thing about somebody or a situation, does that make us happy? Not really. I can testify to this. Because after I wrote this, then yesterday, it was a good day. You know, I'd done my devotions. It was good. Everything was really, and then about halfway through the morning, I started feeling really grumpy. And I started nitpicking everything my poor husband was doing. Bless his heart. I've already apologized. I'm really sorry. I was grumpy, and I didn't seem to be able to get past it. And then I was thinking, well, this is just nice because I'm preaching on joy, and I don't feel like I have any at all. So then I thought, well, maybe I need to think about what exactly am I saying, and maybe I can learn from myself. So am I receiving grace? I think so. I mean, I feel like I am. I had good devotions. I felt really good. Things were really good. Am I extending grace? Not really. <laughs> Not at all. Nope. Nope, I'm not. That was my downfall right there. So I just needed to make a readjustment. I went and confessed to my husband, and he graciously forgave me, and we moved forward and had a fantastic day after I realized what I was doing. I was robbing myself. I was not protecting my own joy. And neither are you when you're feeling that way. When you're nitpicking, when we're grumbling, we're not protecting our joy. And we're not protecting the joy of anybody around us either. 
makes it hard on everybody else. So how do we change the habit? Well, humility is a great place to start. That's what I learned yesterday. (laughs) And Mary actually puts that into her song in verse 51. She says, God has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. So we need to get rid of prideful thoughts. Mary said that. God scatters those who are proud. When we're arrogant, it literally does something to our brain that our brain does not function properly. We're focused on prideful things, and so we have forgotten that God is in control, and we don't have that peace that comes when we believe that, and so our thoughts begin to get scattered. We aren't receiving grace because we aren't extending grace, and therefore we have no joy. Mary goes on to sing that God has lifted up the humble. That's in verse 52. God has lifted up the humble. The humble, who are they? Those are the ones who depend on God for their self-worth. That's what that means. That's what it means to be humble. Did you know that your self-worth does not depend on somebody else? Did you know that? What someone says about you does not determine your self-worth. What choices your kids make does not determine your value as a parent. What achievements you make don't determine your goodness. What Christmas presents you do or don't receive does not determine the amount of love you are worthy of receiving. So many times we attach feelings and emotion and self-worth to those things, but really our self-worth is I am who God says I am, right? And that's the truth of it, and that's what we need to be focused on. Our self-worth depends on God. And when we have our self-worth depending on God, then he will lift us up. That's what Mary is singing about. Another way to protect your joy is to invest in others, to invest in others. And Mary, she's a fine example of this as well. Remember, there's something supernatural that happens to us when we share with somebody. Mary invested in Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth was six months pregnant, right, at the beginning of our story today. She's six months pregnant. Mary stayed with her. The Bible says in verse 56, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Think it through. If she was six months pregnant and Mary stayed three months with her, was Mary there when John was born? I don't know. She might have been. I mean, it it doesn't say clearly, but she could have been. Either way, it's very clear that Mary stayed in the last three months of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Instead of going back home and feeling sorry for herself or feeling overwhelmed or hiding because she didn't want anybody to know her story because she didn't know what to say or do, she invested in Elizabeth. She was there to pick that off the floor when Elizabeth couldn't bend over and reach it. Mary helped her. And I'm sure they encouraged one another. And they, she helped her. She invested. And there's something, like I said, that's supernatural when we invest in somebody else, when we give to somebody else. It's important to always be ready because we never know when God is going to bring an opportunity along to share with somebody and to minister to them, to benefit, to give them God's love and to share that with them. We had an opportunity earlier this week. Actually, it was a couple weeks ago. Um, Ezra and I w- went to a restaurant, and we were getting our lunch, and um, there was a waitress there, and she's, she's helped us before, and she's generally very spunky and very cute, and, and we have a lot of fun with her when we're there, and she just wasn't herself, and we could tell, and she kept saying, I'm sorry, I can't think clearly. I'm so sorry, I can't think clearly. And we were like, it's okay, it's good, it's all good. And, um, and then um, I felt very clearly the Lord say to me, you need to go over to her, and you need to tell her this. And I was like, wow, okay, that's kind of out there, Lord. I'm not sure how she's going to receive that. And he was like, that, how she receives that is not your concern. I'm telling you to go do it. So I took a deep breath and said a prayer as I walked over to the counter. And I, I leaned forward, and she leaned forward to me. And I said, I don't know if you believe in God or not, but I do. And when I'm having a rough day like the one you seem to be having right now, I have to lean on him. I need God to get me through that day. He is my strength for that day, and I don't know where I'd be without him. And I'm going to pray for you. She grabbed my arm and teared up and thanked me. And that was the end of it. It was good. We prayed for her. Went on our way. And I didn't think, I I, I thought more of it because I prayed for her regularly throughout the week because God kept bringing her to my mind. And then I noticed that she connected with me privately on Facebook. She found me. 
And she said, you know, that morning, th that day you came to me, earlier in the morning I had been thinking, I wish I had something like faith. I mean, I really don't know what faith is, and I don't know how to get it, but I wish I had it. Is that not miraculous that God then brings us to her particular place of, wor of where she works? Places it on our hearts to say something, and he and, and and you know praise the Lord that I wasn't feeling selfish and looking inward that day and grumbling about something because I would have missed it. But what if I'd been too nervous to speak to her? Oh, I can't do that, you know. Yeah, would have missed it. What if I'd been critical of the way she was serving us? Hmm, I never would have seen the pain she was in. I never would have heard the voice of the Lord to go encourage her, and who knows where this ministry will lead. I expect to see her here someday. Receiving and extending grace is the only way to know and experience joy. Receiving and extending grace is the only way to experience joy this Christmas and all year long. It's the only way. We might need to make some adjustments in the way we live and the way we think. God, help us. If you've never received God's grace before, or you're at a place where maybe you've received his grace, but you feel like, you know what, I just need an extra dose because I just haven't been on, I haven't been walking with him, I, I just need to straighten things out. And we're going to take an opportunity right now to pray and to ask to receive God's grace. So if you can bow your heads with me, and we're all going to pray together. I'm going to pray this out loud. Repeat after me. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. I receive your grace right now. I make you my Lord and Savior. Amen. Lord, thank you for being faithful as you had names or faces flash across our minds right then. Lord, help us. Sometimes it's hard to have grace, <laughs> but help us, Lord, to see a difference in the way we extend grace because we're trying to be faithful to you. And you have forgiven us of so much. Lord, teach us throughout this week more about you, more about joy. Help us to protect our joy and our hope and our peace. We give you praise. You are worthy. You are holy. We celebrate you today. Amen.